Central never busy, always on the line. You may hear from heaven almost any time. This her royal service, free for one and all. When you get in trouble, give this royal line a call. Telephone to glory, oh what joy divine! I can feel the current moving on the line. Built by God the Father, for is loved and own. We may talk to Jesus through this royal telephone. There will be no charges, telephone is free. It was built for service, just for you and me. There will be no waiting on this royal line. Telephone to glory always answers just in time. Telephone to glory, oh what joy divine. I can feel the current moving on the line. Built by God the Father for His loved and own. We may talk to Jesus through this royal telephone. Fail to get the answer, Satan's crossed your wire. By some strong delusion or some base desire. Take away obstruction, God is on the throne. And you'll get the answer through this royal telephone. Telephone to glory, oh what joy divine. I can feel the current moving on the line. Built by God the Father, for His love and own. We may talk to Jesus through this royal telephone. If your line is grounded and the connection true, has been lost with Jesus, tell you what to do. Prayer and faith promise, mend the broken wall, till your soul is burning with the Pentecostal fire. Telephone to glory, oh what joy divine, I can feel the current moving on the line. Built by God the Father for His love and own. We may talk to Jesus through this royal telephone. Carnal combinations cannot get control of this line to glory anchored in the soul. Storm and trial cannot disconnect the line held in constant keeping by the Father's hand divine. Telephone to glory, oh what joy divine, I can feel the current moving on the line, built by God the Father for his love and own. We may talk to Jesus 
through this royal telephone I would not be denied I would not be denied Till Jesus came and made me all I would not be denied I would not be denied I would not be denied Till Jesus came and made me own I would not be denied Till Jesus came and made me own I would not be I will not be denied till Jesus comes and makes me whole. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your holy name. We glorify you. We exalt you. We adore you and worship you. Father, we thank you because of your love. We thank you because of your power. We thank you because of your revelation. We thank you, Lord, because you've gathered us together here so that you will do us good. Thank you, Lord, because of the privilege of praying. Thank you because of the power that resides in praying. Thank you because of the possibilities in prayer. We bless your name, O oh Lord, because you have granted us the chance to come. And here we are, so that we can appear in your presence and be blessed mightily by you. Father, we pray you pour your blessings down upon everyone in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, we thank you because of the ministry in songs already. That assures us that we can telephone to glory. And that we can talk directly unto our Heavenly Father. Because Jesus Christ has opened that line. And Father, we pray that all through this time of the retreat, as we'll be talking to you, we pray, O oh Lord, the windows and the gates of heaven will open. We pray that the very reservoirs of heaven will open. And you will shower your blessings down upon everyone in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you because we have the assurance, we have the faith within us that we shall not be denied. And we'll keep on at the altar, praying unto our God until Jesus comes and he blesses us and he releases us and he takes us and changes us completely. We will not stop praying, Lord, from this very time. Till all the messages are given, to the very end of the retreat, we're going to be calling upon your name. And we know that great and mighty things you will do for every one of us in Jesus' name. The cold, you'll put the fire of heaven upon them. The weary, the power and the courage of heaven upon them. Those who are defeated in the way, you'll give victory to everyone. And those who do not even know where they are, whether in the kingdom or in the world, assurance will come to them. And those who are just a lying down fallow, not doing anything, we pray, oh Lord, that zeal from above, power from on high, will come upon every such an individual in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we're looking up to you. That real transformation will happen to every heart. A real change of heart, a real change of life, a real change of destiny, a real change of ministry, that the fire and the zeal of heaven 
will come within every soul, every heart, and you'll transform everyone in life, in conduct, in behavior, in ministry, in everything, every area, in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, we come before you, believing that everything that needs to be touched in our lives, you are going to touch. Everything that needs a transformation, a change, you are going to touch. Father, we pray that none of us will ever remain the same after this retreat in Jesus' name. Lord, you will use us as your battle axe. You will use us as your instrument to bring a change in every city, in every town, in every local government area, in every place where people meet together to call upon the name of the Lord. You will use us as instruments to bring them more closer unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Lord, as we come this session to look at the very possibilities of prayer, how we pray that heaven will speak to us. And we pray that we'll hear the voice of our own Heavenly Father and it will show us what prayers can do in every life in Jesus' name. That Lord, those of us who have been weak in praying, you'll strengthen us so that we'll be able to rise and really pray that all through the time of this retreat will prayers will be ascending unto heaven in the hostels in the hall of meeting here even right there in the open everywhere in the morning afternoon night and day oh lord we pray that prayers will be going ascending to heaven in jesus name as our prayers go up then the blessings will come down that lord real revival outpouring of your power upon everyone you will effect in jesus name we bless your name because we know you have answered and we'll see the very manifestation with our very eyes in our own lives and in the lives of other people too thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray I welcome every one of you formally to a workers' retreat at this time. Last night, we should have given the first message, the possibilities of prayer. But because quite a number of us were still coming on the way, I thought it necessary that we'll take the message this morning, more so that many of us last night were quite weak because of long traveling and such a message like this I felt is not something that any of us should miss and so that is why we're looking at the Word of God now concerning the possibilities of prayer your very life hangs on this message your destiny depends upon this message what you are or what you become in the kingdom of God depends upon your understanding on prayer. Not only your understanding, your ability to be able to make use of that tool that heaven has granted inhabitants of the earth. So that you'll be able to touch the very throne of God and something marvelous can happen in your life and through your life in the lives of other people. In Psalm 65. Verse 2, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Well, maybe the offspring of Adam talk about the divine personality that answers prayer. Well, may pilgrims on their way to heaven talk about the need of prayer and the necessity of talking to the one that answers prayer well may the one that has been overcome by all the vicissitudes and difficulties and dangers in life that is that are brought by the devil well may they look up to the mountains from whence their help will come and well may the summits who had faced troubles around troubles without troubles within well may such a summit look up to a particular place where answers can come to prayer O thou that hearest prayer 
looking back to the history of the people of God. And as the psalmist would have recollected, the people that followed the Lord in ages past, times past. And then he had gone through a catalog of the people that used prayer to make a change in their lives. As he looked at the whole of the children of Israel, that the very existence of the children of Israel on earth depended on prayer and the help they got from God. Well, may the psalmist then look at the history of his own nation and say, O thou that hearest prayer, looking at himself, the psalmist looking at the difficulties he passed through, and looking at the fact that here we are today, not because we are wise, not because we are strong, here was the psalmist, not because he was better than other people. His presence, his existence at that time, showed the very power and the possibilities of prayer, well, may that psalmist then say, O thou that hearest prayer, then he said unto thee, Shall all flesh come? As the psalmist looked at the needs all over the earth, the need of every individual, man or woman, then he said, A time will come. In fact, the time has now arrived when all flesh will have to come unto the Lord. Because we need the power of the Lord to sustain us. The provision of the Lord to keep us going. We need the Lord in every way. And therefore he says unto thee, shall all flesh come. In Psalm 62 and verse 8. It says, trust in him at all times. Ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. As you look around you at this time, as you look at the uncertainty in many lives, you look at the insecurity around many people, and you look at the confusion all around you at this time, the only thing that the psalmist will want to tell you so that you will be able to have an anchor for your soul is trust in him at all times and at such a time like this and as you look back in your life you would have discovered the time you were defeated is because you, maybe you never read this the time you were put plowed under and you could not get the victory maybe because you never noticed this Trust in him at all times. Times of temptation. Times of trial. Times of confusion. Times of affliction. Times of disappointment. Times of discouragement. Times of weakness. Times when the devil is wanting to take over your very life. Times when it appears you don't know whether you'll be able to get through. At times when it appears that you might just turn around and get away from the way that gets to heaven and go the other direction. At all times, when the devil appears strong, when enemies of progress, spiritual progress, are making war with your life. When in your own self, you know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When it appears that the flesh is warring against your soul. And all the decisions you have taken to march on and get to the very final end where the Lord is waiting for you. When it appears that all hope is gone at all times. When your friends depart from you. When your, even your own relatives will act as if they never knew you. When there is so much division. When there is so much uh, discouragement in your own family circle. When the job the spiritual duty, the work you are called upon to do, when it is so heavy and you want to give up, trust in the Lord at all times. When in your own family, it appears that maybe you are the only one that is saved. And the rest of the members of the family, they are trying to even pull you back, saying that they do not want this gospel, this new life, to be in any member of the family. And there's no encouragement coming from anywhere. And it appears that the situation is hopeless. Trust in him at all times. 
when it appears there's no solution for the problem you are carrying about. And when you think, has anybody ever got this problem and overcome? I'm almost giving up. My mountain is greater than I can carry. And I prayed and fasted, and it appears things are not changing. Trust in him at all times. Ye people, pour out your heart before him. There are times you will not find a human ear to pour your heart out to. There are times the people you talk to about your trials, about your temptations, about your difficulties. There are times the people you talk to will not even understand. And therefore it says, get a secluded place. Get an isolated place. Get a place of no interruption, no disturbance. And pour out your heart unto the Lord. Why? Because God is a refuge for us. And I want to tell you that the reason we're here at this workers' retreat, you may not even know why you are here. That brings to mind the story of David. You see, early in life, that man, he knew the Lord as a young man. And then he came to a particular situation. Although his father had sent him, but his father had a limited understanding as to why David was being sent to where he was going. Although David himself accepted and responded to the challenge to go to the place he went, little did he know the reason, the actual reason why he was going there. And in fact, when he got there, his own senior brothers, they challenged him. They said, what are you finding here? Why are you here? That little thing you are doing over there, have you left that in the hands of anyone who is taking care of that now? Should you be here at this time? And then David gave an answer. And that answer is very significant for you and for me. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 29. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Here we are. It may be that your pastor had submitted your name, that you are one of the workers in your local church, and then gave you information that you ought to be here. But even as you have come, perhaps you are wondering, why am I here? And then we need to give the answer that David gave. Is there not a cause? Or maybe you have missed your own retreat for your own region, which came in last week. And then you said, I think I ought to be there. I think I can still have the opportunity. After all, I'm a worker in my own region. I missed my opportunity. Let me join the new search. And then maybe since you came last night, you've been wondering, should I have come? Shouldn't I just have let it go like that? Since I missed it, I missed it. Is there not a cause of us who are here? And you've listened to what we did last night. And you'll be here this morning as well. And you're saying, is this why I came? Is this all I'm going to get? What's the prospect? And what do I have in front of me? And I want to ask you and I want to say the same thing that David had said. Is there not a cause? David, why? Were you sent over there? After all, Saul told him later, you are a young man, but this Goliath that you see is being a warrior from his youth. But as then he began to try on all the armor of Saul. And then he said, why am I putting this on? Is there not a cause? And then when he began to ask the question, what will be done to this man that will kill this fellow that is defying the almighty God? And his brother said, Why are you asking such a question? You as a small boy, you want to waste your life? We know the pride of your heart. Then David said, Is there not a cause? What cause? I don't know whether David knew all the causes. But number one, to see God at work. You know, when David got there, although he said, Is there not a cause? What cause will that be, David? Well, for one thing, after the whole thing had happened, 
he knew that it will be for number one to see God at work. Isn't that one of the reasons why you are here? There is a lot that needs to be done in your heart. A lot that needs to be done in your life. A lot that, need, that needs to be done in your understanding. A lot that needs to be done so that the Lord can fit you for the part you ought to take in the temple of the living God. And you have come here to see God at work. Number two, to defeat the champion enemy against the children of Israel. Little did David know the cause why he was sent over there. And maybe you do not know why you are here. There is an enemy, champion enemy, the devil, the adversary that is waging war against the souls of men in your locality. And God wants to use you like a little David, a young David, so that you will, in the power of the Lord, de defeat the champion enemy against the work of God, against the people of God. Number three, to taste God's power and demonstrate his supremacy. You see, before that time, David had learned how to throw stones from the sling, but he never knew that throwing stones out of the sling could kill the champion of the enemy camp, of the enemy army. But then, he had got that instrument in his hand. Maybe there are a lot of things to have got. The scriptures you have known, the songs you have learned, the prayers you can pray, the ministry you already have, but you do not even know that that thing can go beyond doing a local work. You do not know that it can be used even for the glory of God in the whole nation. And so you have come so that you can taste the power of God and demonstrate the supremacy of the Almighty. Number four. To become an instrument of strength to God's people. Before David came on the scene, the people of God were weak. And they were trembling. But then when David came on the scene, and he said, why are you here? What have you come to do here? We know the pride of your heart. He, he said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Am I not here for this reason? So that I will be an instrument. In the hand of the Almighty God to strengthen the hearts of the weakened Israelites. Isn't that why you are here? We have a lot of people in your region, in your local government, and we have a lot of people in your local church. They want to believe God. They are counted as the Israel of God, but they are weak. Anytime there's temptation, they are weak. Anytime the enemy will brag and boast, they are weak. God has brought you here so that eventually you'll become an instrument of strength to God's people. Number six, to prove the reason for the new anointing. And do you know that David had just been anointed in the previous chapter, chapter 16? And he just got the anointing upon him and then he went to Saul and played the harp, and the evil spirits departed. And then he went back to looking over the sheep. But then he didn't know that the new anointing had anything more to be done. And then God, in his own wisdom, God in his own way, arranged it so that David will be able to go there and go and prove the reason for the new anointing. And the Lord wants you here to have a new anointing before you go. And I'm believing God and praying you'll have a new anointing upon your life in Jesus' name. But then, not just to have the new anointing, to be able to prove the reason and to prove why you have got that new anointing. Then, another reason to lift up God's name from the mire. Did, did you hear that Goliath bragging and boasting? Defying the God of Israel. And even cursing by his own idols. And here came David. So that he would lift up the name of God from the mud, from the mire. Don't you see your locality? How the people that do not know Jesus Christ. How they are putting the name of the Lord in the mud. Don't you see your locality? How the people that have not been born again. How they are ridiculing the name of our God. The Lord has brought you here. So that through you, by the grace of God, 
the name of the Lord. That though some believers are put down through you, that name will come up once again in Jesus' name. Then also, it is to testify of God's past goodness and to move to greater exploits in the Lord. David didn't know that he would have a chance to give his testimony. When he got there, and then Saul said, Young man, you cannot do this. You cannot go and face Goliath. Then a chance came to be able to give the testimony of the past goodness of the Lord. And he said, Your servant, do a young man, was for the sheep. And then a lion came. By the strength of the Lord, I was able to overcome him. A bear came another time. I was able to destroy him. This Philistine will be just like one of them. You have come here so that you'll be able to renew your covenant with the Lord. You'll be able to renew that testimony and share that testimony with other people. And then by the grace of God from here on, you'll be able to move on to greater exploits in the name of Jesus. Another reason was to come into victory and ministry that continued for life. Up until that time, David had been a private individual. Private in this sense. Although he watched over sheep, private. Although he was uh, very respected and loved in his own family, that was private. Although he even went to King Saul and he played on an instrument, all that was in the locality. Now think about this. All the camp of the Philistines... They were in their array, in their thousands. And a camp for the children of Israel, they were in their thousands. And God had done something for this man privately. And God wanted that to come into public. And so God brought him. At that time, is there not a cause? David didn't know all this at that time. But when his brothers challenged him and said, Why are you here? What are you finding here? What's the matter with you? Well, who have you left all those things with? He said, what have I done? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I'm not here just by myself. There is an inner witness that I ought to be here. What have I done on my own? What, am I, what have I done in my own free volition? What have I done by just taking time, life into my hand? What have I done that the Lord has not told me to do? What have I done that is so strange? Is there not a cause? And you know, as you are here today, and you may be wondering, and the devil may be making you to wonder, why are you here? Why are you even called part of deeper life? Why are you still staying? Why are you still with all these workers? And the devil might even be asking you, do you belong here? Should you be part of those people? Look at the weakness in your life. And look at all the things you are still crying about in your life. Do you belong? Are you part of those people? Should you be there? Is there not a cause why you are here? Is there not a reason why God has brought you here? It may be that you are young. And somebody can look at you and say, Who brought you here? Who wrote your name to come here? What kind of thing are they doing in your region that they'll bring a person like you here? And you may not know the answer to give. But is there not a cause? Is there not a reason? And so they challenge David. Why are you here? What are you doing here? Why did you leave that other place? Is there not a cause? David, what's the cause? Many causes. One. I've told you a lot of things, but now to come into victory and ministry that will continue for life. This would be the first time for David when he challenged the Philistines for the rest of his life. He kept on challenging the Philistines. The victory that starts in your life today will continue for the rest of your life. The ministry, the challenge that comes upon your life. That maybe it will be your fourth time as you come here. You are putting on and you, you are engaging in battle against the Philistine. It will continue from victory to victory in your life in Jesus' name. 
Is there not a cause? David, why are you here? Another reason. To change the history and the destiny of the defeated. It became a turning point. In the lives of the children of Israel, they were already feeling defeated. You see, they are told Samuel, choose a king for us. A king that you'll be able to go before us into battle. And Samuel was displeased with that request. And he went into prayer. And God said, they want a king, choose a king for them. A king that will go before them in battle. And now the king had been chosen. And a king had led them to battle. And he thought, now everything is okay. And now the Philistine came, Goliath came, and said, choose you a man. And which better man can you choose? The one that is shoulder and head above all the other children of Israel. If he can come, here I stand, let him come to me. And Saul began to tremble. And when they saw that Saul, the tallest of them all, the strongest of them all, when he began to tremble, what happened to the rest of the people? They began to tremble too. And then David came to change the history and the destiny of the defeated. Maybe in your own locality, a lot of people are afraid. How can we live in victory over sin? How can we stand on this sound doctrine contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints? How can the church keep on marching on? And everybody is afraid because of the confrontation that Goliath in your locality has posed against them. And now you have come to this retreat so that God will work on you. And through you, he'll work on the people back at home in Jesus' name. So that by the grace of God, you'll be an instrument to change the history and the destiny of the people who are defeated. Is there not a cause? David, what cause also? To weaken the enemy and keep them permanently under. After that time, any time they heard of the God of Israel, any time they heard about David, all the Philistines, they were afraid. Because from the victory he got at that time, it weakened the enemy camp. And any time they heard of David and Israel, those Philistines were kept permanently under. And we have come here. So that by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, we will keep the enemy under. The things that had made us afraid, the things that had made us to feel that Jesus cannot carry us through in this Christian life, the things that had made us to feel that the things we see, the things we hear, the things we feel are greater than the one that lives within us. We have come here so that by the grace of God, we're going to be so strengthened and so empowered that we will weaken the enemy. In fact, Satan himself will come under your feet. And then we'll keep the devil under permanently. And we'll teach the young ones, we'll teach the coming ones how to fight in the battle of the Lord. There are three subtitles that I want to think about. Number one is a call to prayer. The call to prayer. During this retreat, to get all the reasons why you have come, to have them fulfilled, you need to respond to the call to prayer. David, I told you, ask the question, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason? My father sent me here, but is there not a reason why God permitted him to send me here? My overseer put down my name as a worker, and I've got the opportunity and I've come. Is there not a reason why God has allowed that channel to be able to grant me the opportunity and now I am here? It was to be able to see how things were going on and to be able to be of help to my brothers. But there is much, much more than that. Maybe when you are coming, you are saying it's the first worker's retreat in the year were here last year and all the reason you have is that since i'm a worker this is my privilege i am going and then you pack your load let us go and when you came here you went around you said this is our church 
and this is our workers retreat and then when the choir was singing you said that is uh, you know our choir and i know that brother and i know that sister all that is wonderful but there is a greater cause than that why you have come and i pray that god will help you to discover why you are here and if the reason why you are here is going to be fulfilled you'll need to respond unto the call to prayer let me go to to psalm 65 again and verse 2 psalm 65 and verse 2 O thou that hearest prayer unto thee shall all flesh come unto thee shall all flesh come if we come to a workers retreat like this and we do not respond to the call to prayer every other thing we do will be like useless in the sight of god because we need the almighty and he has invited us to pray he is the creator of the heavens and the earth the all-sufficient god the limitless unlimited omnipotent god is calling you and i to his presence so that we can talk together and so that we can reveal our needs unto him how can we understand this great privilege it is the high calling the lowly and really you know in this world the lowly and the high sometimes they have nothing in common together the rich and the poor they have nothing in common together the one that is popular and the one that is not known they have nothing in common together but here is the god of heaven the creator of the universe the one that is so high so great and almighty is calling us who are nothing just dust in the balance is calling us to his presence what a great privilege and opportunity is the holy one calling the sinful you see when you think about man naturally man is a sinner all have sinned and come short of the glory of god but then it's the almighty holy one calling the one that is sinful saying if you are sinful come to the fountain and i will cleanse you the holy calling the simple is the powerful calling the weak when you compare yourself with god you have to confess you have to accept you are strong but i am weak in comparison to god and yet here is the god of all power and the god of all strength calling the weak saying you know you are weak come unto me i will give you the strength here is the possessor of all things calling the poor we who have nothing at all we have nothing in ourselves and of ourselves and even the little we have is like a grain of sand in comparison to all the great things that god has and here is the possessor of all things calling the poor saying come and it says, you that answers prayer, unto you shall all flesh come. There is no partiality with him. Anyone can come, everyone should come. Unto you that answers prayer, unto you shall all flesh come. What are they coming for? One, they are coming for salvation. You see, we cannot save ourselves. The Bible says, by the deeds of the Lord shall no man be justified in his sight. Your good works cannot save you. All your self-righteousness cannot save you. Trying the best you can will not be able to save you. But then he calls us, who cannot save ourselves? He says, come for salvation. That's why unto oh, thou that answerest pray unto thee shall all flesh come. Not only that, we come for peace of mind. The Bible says there is no peace, says the Lord, to the wicked. And we have tasted of the unrest, of the confusion, of the strain and stress within, of the heavy load and the heavy yoke of the world, of the unrest, the restlessness that is in the heart of the unbeliever. And here the Lord, that is all peace and the author of peace, he calls upon you that has no peace, he says, come. O thou that hearest the petition of the people that are confused and heavy laden in this world, unto you shall all those people come for the peace of mind. Assurance of sonship. There are some people that every time they hear you can be a child of God, the devil will say, 
Is that not your call? But I gave my life to the Lord last week. Are you sure you are a child of God? They do not have assurance. And it's only in the presence of God. You'll be able to have the assurance of sonship. And the Lord is saying, as we come to a retreat like this, there is a God who answers prayer. And unto him shall all flesh come. And you can come to him for assurance of sonship. Victory over sin. You see, there are people that have not heard. From our Lord Jesus Christ, you have been made whole. But go and sin no more. Lest a worse sin come upon thee. They have not heard the voice of Jesus like that woman. Where are those that accuse us? As no man condemned thee, no man, Lord. Neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. There are some people that have not heard directly from the Son of God. That now they can have victory over sin. To go and sin no more. Why do we come? Why we call to prayer? So that he'll give us salvation if we need to be saved. He'll give us a peace of mind if that is your need. He'll give us assurance of sonship if that is the peculiar need in your life. He'll give you victory over sin if you have been defeated in the temptations that came in your life. Not only that, the provision for all needs. The provision for all our needs. Because it is this God of heaven that can supply and will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's the reason he calls us to prayer. Not only that transformation and circumcision of heart. Because the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. And the heart of your seed. That you may love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That thou mayest live. And so he has called us at this time. If the depravity is still there. If the original stain is still there. If uh, the original sin is still there. He's saying that I want to circumcise your heart. And he calls us to prayer. He says, when you call upon me, I will do that for you. For the power of the Spirit. He says, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then will you be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. He calls us for the power of the Holy Ghost. And I pray that in this retreat, those of us who have not been filled and saturated, empowered, energized by the Spirit of God, you'll have the power of the Holy Ghost in your life in Jesus' name. But you'll have to pray. And as the reason God is calling you to prayer, that this retreat will be time that will give to real praying. It's for the removal of mountains. You see, if we check up one by one here, you might point to this and say, that's a mountain. And that's a mountain, and that's a mountain in my life. And I want to ask you a question. The mountain had been there, you pointed to it five years ago, six years ago, maybe three years ago, maybe last year. And you've been mentioning that mountain every time. My question to you is, when is this mountain going to be removed? Are you going to just learn to live with the mountain when you have a God who can remove every mountain? When the possibility of prayer is there to take the mountain away from your life and family. When faith, as a grain of mustard seed, can say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and it shall be so. How long are we going to stay with mountains? In this retreat, we come to remove those mountains. And so we are told to call upon the name of the Lord. You are called to prayer so that those mountains will be removed. We come here and we are called to prayer for the opening of the prison doors for the captives. Here is Peter. And the authorities that were opposed to the gospel, they had arrested him. And he locked him up. And he was in the prison. And he himself had resigned himself to the condition in which he found himself. He was now asleep, saying, there's nothing I can do. The end has come. I will end up in this prison cell. And then the church, we're told in Acts chapter 12 verse 5, that the church prayed continually for Peter. And then a miracle took place. Those prison doors were opened. And prison doors are going to open. The captives are going to be let loose. And as the Lord is listening to us as we are praying, 
he knows that this, these are the reasons why we are called upon to pray. And as we pray, it will be so in Jesus' name. And we are called upon to pray so that we can also live the life of Christ on earth. Live the life of Christ on earth. That will take a long time to explain. If you look at the life of Jesus Christ, you know he said, The prince of this world cometh and he has nothing in me. When you get to that point, when you can look at those villagers and the prince, the one that represents the prince of the world in that village, the idol, the village idol, and all their rituals and everything that represents the God of this world there, when you can say very boldly and you can declare before them, the prince of this locality cometh and he has nothing in me. When you can say, this church, your own local church, is built upon the rock, and the gates of hell cannot, will not, shall not prevail against it, then we know that this retreat has done something in your life. And it will do something. I said it will do something. But it will be because you have responded to the call to pray. Prayer brings revival. Prayer brings life for the dead. Prayer brings refreshing for the weary. Prayer brings strength for those who are fainting. This is the reason we are called upon to pray in Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. Call unto me. Call unto me. Many times we're called unto the doctor. Call unto me. Many times we're called unto uncle. Call unto me. Many times we're called to a senior brother. Call unto me. Many times we're called unto the counselor. Call unto me. Many times we're called upon the pastor. Call unto me. Many times we're called upon people that will enslave us. They give us a little thing, then they tie the rope around our leg, we become our slaves. But the Almighty God, the one that is able to do all things, the one that brought everything out of nothing, He calls upon you and He says, Call unto me. He says, Why are you suffering? I put you in the world to be victorious. I put you in the world to have a fulfilled life. I put you in the world so that all that I know about my only begotten son, I will reproduce in you. I put you in the world so that the very image of Jesus Christ will be transferred into you. And will find a little Christ there, a Christian, a person that knows the power of God on earth. And why don't you call upon me when that image had been defaced? And when you didn't really achieve and when you were not fulfilled, the things I expected will be fulfilled in you. Now it says, the opportunity is still there. Call unto me and I will answer thee. It, it doesn't say, call unto me and if I'm in a good mood, I will answer you. If you call at the right time, I will answer you. If I am not too busy, I will answer you. If I'm not dealing with other things that are more important than your little self, I will answer you. You know, some people feel that they are very, very small. They feel they are insignificant. They say, look at the billions of people on the earth. If I call upon God, will he look at the little need that my little self that I have? It is the almighty God who cannot lie and who changes not. It is him who has said, call unto me. And then he said, I will. I will, I will, not that I may, I will definitely answer thee and show thee, and show thee some small, insignificant thing, just to silence you and say, go your way. Is that the Bible? How many of us, since we became saved, have even got anything like this, we can say great and mighty things. Great and mighty things. The things we're asking God are the little, little things. Loaf of bread, cup of rice, removal of headache, and a little money, and house rent, and the little, little things that even unbelievers have. But God said, 
Why is it you child of the king? Why is it the almighty is inviting you to come into his great unlimited reservoir? To come and ask about great and mighty things. And all you're asking for is a cup of rice. A cup of gari. And heaven looks at you and says, what kind of fellow is this? That the almighty, the one that has no end, the one whose reservoir has no length, has no breadth, has no height, has no bottom. The one who has everything beyond what human mind can comprehend. He has called upon these children of his to come and ask great and mighty things and look at what they are asking. I pray that your prayer will change. It says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and show thee, even you, and show you great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. If you don't get anything new from this retreat, you have not prayed. You say, I am saved. If you don't get anything more than that, you have not prayed. I am sanctified already. If you don't get, because he said, I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. If you don't get more than the sanctification you've got before, it means you have not prayed. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost and I speak in tongues. If you do not get more than that, then you have not prayed. Well, I've got my healing. If you don't get more than that, you have not prayed. I've been preaching the gospel and when I preach, I've seen about uh, 50 people coming to the Lord. If you don't get more than that in this retreat, you have not prayed. We came here and we really mean business with God. And this retreat is going to be praying retreat. In the hostel, we will pray. In the hall here, we will pray. On the road, we will pray. We will leave an indelible mark of prayer here before we go back. That even the people that enter here another time, they will sense that power of prayer. They will sense the anointing in that prayer. And they will say, who came here? As, as soon as I just entered that place, I felt I want to pray. As soon as I got into that uh, hostel, I felt I want to pray. Well, in my house before, if I just lie on the bed like that, I sleep off. But since I came to this place, as soon as I got on who slept here before, as soon as I just got on that bed, there was the prayer rising up from my heart. Somebody that stayed here before I came must have been somebody that prayed like no other person prayed. That's what we want this retreat to be. So that in the hostel, you leave the prayer mark behind. In the kitchen, you leave the prayer mark behind. On the road, on the way, you leave the prayer mark behind. And even when you are going back, as you are going back, instead of just talking and chatting, in the vehicle there, you leave a prayer mark behind. That the drivers who are driving you back, before they get back, they'll know how to pray in the name of Jesus. And they will know the power of prayer in their lives, because this is what the Lord is telling you. He says, Call unto me. And then he says, I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And I pray that the Lord will do that through you and through me in Jesus' name. Number two. The prerequisite and the power of prayer. The prerequisite and the power of prayer. First of all, the prerequisite. You see, if we're going to pray, and I mean real praying, a prayer that will touch heaven, a prayer that will make a mark in your life and in the lives of other people, there must be some prerequisites we're going to think about in Psalm 66 and verse 18. Psalm 66 and verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You know, the Lord has not left us in darkness. He has not left us to be wondering, why have I not been answered? He told me to call upon him. He said he will answer me. Why is it my prayer has not been answered? Oh, he says very clearly, if I regard iniquity in my heart, if that sin is there, the adultery, the fornication, the stealing, the gambling, the smoking and the drinking. If that sin is there, the lying, the deception, the slander, the negative criticism, if that sin is there, 
the lack of forgiveness, the lack of love in the heart of such an individual. And the Lord is saying, when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive you, for if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. If that unforgiveness is there, lack of love is there, and you will not let go. He has hurt me. He has thrown something at me. He has said something about me, and I don't like what he has done, and you will not forgive. Look at what you are going to miss. The great and the mighty things you are going to miss. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But you will not regard iniquity in your heart. There's nothing you want to do with iniquity. Nothing you want to do with sin. No matter what that sin might have uh, looked like in the past, we are dropping everything in this place in Jesus' name. Uh, you know, there, there are people that do not know what they are missing. It's like a little child. He holds maybe just a one naira note. And all that that thing will do is to give him a one naira enjoyment, a one naira pleasure, a one naira comfort, a one naira provision. And here is somebody that's saying, give up the one naira enjoyment. Give up the temporary enjoyment and pleasure. And here you are, you can have a 1,000 naira joy and happiness and pleasure. But you have to give up the 1 naira pleasure before you can have the 1,000 naira enjoyment and fulfillment. And because this child is so ignorant and he does not know and does not have the sense of proper comparison, he's holding on to the 1 naira enjoyment and the 1 naira pleasure because he does not know the value of what we are offering him. You see, when you are holding on to sin, it's like that little temporary thing. Immorality? Or looking at a particular pornographic picture? Or you call it masturbation? Or whatever you name you want to give it, is such a temporary thing, a short-lived thing, a thing that does not continue for even five minutes, and then it will give you a lifetime of heartbreak. A lifetime of regret, a lifetime of sorrow, a lifetime of the sense of defeat. And the Lord is saying, give up your one naira pleasure and let me give you something that you will never forget. I pray you will respond. I pray you will be wise. And all those things that you have been holding on to, the useless things of life that have no meaning and no pleasure at all, except heartache and eternal judgment, will give up everything and will have something greater from the Lord in Jesus' name. If our hearts are right with God, then answers to prayer will not have any limit. As you look at the Bible, and you think about the people that prayed, Eliezer prayed, for guidance in Isaac's marriage, it came right there immediately. Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah, for their preservation. And God will even grant a mortal man to talk to him about changing his mind on the judgment that should have come upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, Abraham even told the condition. He said, God, if you find ten righteous people in that place, will you not spare them? Abra Think about it. Abraham. Abraham said, I'm only dust and ashes. I am nothing in myself, but I've taken it upon me to speak unto the Lord of lords and the King of kings. If you find only ten people there, will you not spare them? And God said, Abraham, my friend, according to what you are requesting, if I find ten righteous people there, I will spare them. If that is the privilege and the power and the possibility of praying, why don't you make use of it? Jacob prayed for the transformation, the softening of the heart of Esau. Esau had these 400 people. And he said, if I see that Jacob, I'm going to wipe him out. No matter what he has, no matter what he says, no matter the strength of his army, I'm going to engage in battle against him. And Jacob, he told all his family to go to the other side. He said, it's time for prayer. Time of trouble, it's time for prayer. It's time of agony, and it's time for prayer. 
It's time when the enemy was advancing against him. And it is time for prayer. It was time when it was the time of the boasting of his twin brother that I'm going to finish him. And it was time for prayer. It was time when Jacob did not have any supporting army. And he said it was time for prayer. Trouble time is time for prayer. And Jacob, he began to wrestle with a man, with an angel that came from on high. And the angel said, Jacob, it's enough. Let me go. Let's stop the prayer. That's enough. Ah. Jacob said, you will not go. I will delay you here. You will not go back to heaven. All of heaven will be asking for you. They will not see you until they give me what I want. I will not let you go except you bless me. You came from heaven. We've been wrestling together since last night. What did you bring? Drop it before you go. What did you come to give me? Drop it before you go. Didn't you know that God told me that the blessing of Abraham and of Isaac will be upon me, Jacob? Confirm it before you go. Don't you know that I'm the one that will become the head of this mighty nation uh, that will be called the children of Israel? Confirm it before you go. Let me go. No, you will not go. You will not go. The day is breaking. No, you will not go. Others will come and meet us here. You will not go. Only one condition. You will bless me before you go. And then he said, what's your, what's your name? He said, well, the name is not what I like. I like a change of name. But this was asking me, my name is Jacob. And he said, you will no more be called Jacob, but Israel. Because as a prince, you have prevailed on God and man. And Jacob said, now you can go. And you tell them in heaven what you have said, and let heaven confirm it. And then he went. And in the morning, here was Esau coming. And Jacob ran, and he met him. And then Esau, his heart has been changed. Enemy had become a friend. And then they embraced one another. And Esau, Esau never cried. That man had been something. He began to cry. They loved one another. Twenty years hatred had gone. Enmity had gone. The person that was, that was saying, I will finish him. I will finish his family. I will finish everything belonging to him. He said, let us go together. And then we can have our journey. And when Jacob said, no, you can go alone. Because of the little children. He said, can I leave some people with you as your bodyguard? Oh, he said, not necessary. You can go. And then Jacob said, can I give you some offering? He said, don't worry. I'm totally changed. I don't hate you again. Everything is gone. Prayer has settled everything. I'm telling you that prayer can do a lot. And as we are here, as we are here to pray, I pray that none of us will ever be the same again in Jesus' name. Moses prayed for the forgiveness of the whole nation, Israel. In the case of Abraham, he said, if you find ten righteous people, in the case of Moses, Moses said, I'm not even telling you, God, if you find 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, or 10, I'm not telling you that you will find ten righteous people. All I'm telling you is I count all of them as your children, whether you find a single person or not, make them righteous. And God said, Moses, I cannot refuse anything you say. You said so. You don't even put any condition. You don't even want ten righteous people so that that will give me a chance to be able to forgive them. He said, no, you will just forgive them just like that free of charge by grace through faith. Are you saved? And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. God didn't see anything in Israel to be able to preserve them. But because of the possibility and the power of prayer, he did. And I prayed and a prophet was born. No prophet in Israel. The priest, the high priest, had totally disappointed God. And then Anna began to pray. And Anna said, I don't want ordinary child. I don't want ordinary blessing. How many people, you know, they, uh, they are praying, Oh God, all I'm asking for, ordinary blessing. Ordinary experience. Ordinary things that I had the other brother say that he had. The other sister say that he had. I want this ordinary thing. Anna said, I don't want ordinary child. I want extraordinary. And then Eli, nobody even prayed with Anna. 
Uh, Eli just said, why are you drunk? Put away all your wine, the drunkenness in you. And she said, I'm not drunk. Man of God, I'm pouring out my heart before the Lord. And then Eli said, it is so according to your request. And it was like that. If Eli, that was not living right, if Eli, whose sons were son of Belial, if Eli, who did not even have the discernment, if when he said, your request be granted you, Anna said, that's all right, that's final. And remember, Eli was not perfect. Here we are in a retreat, and we are not like Eli. If God confirmed what Eli said, what if I tell you that your prayers are answered? What if I tell you that that mountain is gone? What if I tell you that the extraordinary thing that God is going to do it in this retreat in Jesus' name? Anna prayed, and when Anna prayed, a prophet was born, and a prophet like no other prophet. A great prophet. What's your prayer going to be? Elijah prayed three years, there was no drop of rain. He had authority over the whole sky. In the whole nation. He held the key in his hand. He said, Rain, I represent God in this place. And I command you, don't fall until I tell you. Authority. Why are we all here? Thousands of us. And you cannot have authority on your village. Authority in your local government. Authority in your region. Authority in your church. Elijah said, I am the one that God sent here until Ahab the king shapes up, no rain. And then three years, three and a half years after, Elijah went and he got Obadiah. And he said, go and tell your master that I want to see him face to face. Obadiah said, man of God, why are you telling me to do that? Because as soon as I'm gone now, the Spirit of God will take you where we don't know where. Because we've been looking for you. And he said, go and tell him, I must see him today. And then Ahab came and saw him. Elijah. Elijah. You are the one that troubles Israel. You kept the key in your pocket. And the millions of the Israelites cannot get any rain at all. Oh yes, he said. It's you troubling Israel. It's because of your sin and the sin of your house. In any case, I'm going to open the heavens now. Go and tell all those prophets of Baal to meet together. We need to fight a battle. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And against the rulers of the darkness of this world. It says, go and call them together. And he called them together. And then all the children of Israel were there. And then he said, you pray to your God, the God that brings fire without striking any match. That God we're going to serve. And those people, more than 400, they cried, they called, they caught themselves. There was nothing. And majestically, Elijah came and said, oh, this is a contest that you'll have. Give us a verdict. You must pray more. Call on him. Is he not a God? If he has gone on a journey, bring him back. If he is sleeping, wake him up. And so they tried more, and there was no result. And then Elijah, he came near the time of the evening sacrifice. And he said, you push aside. And then he said, pour water to make the miracle more difficult. And when they had poured the water and they laid the sacrifice, he looked up to heaven. Blessed are those pure in heart. They shall see God. The person who can come to the point of prayer like this and there is no guilt and there is no condemnation and there is no skeleton in his cupboard and there is no besetting sin that can look up to high holy heaven and say, God, I come. I'm your representative. Bring down the fire so that these people will know that you are a God, our God indeed. Before he finished, the fire fell. And the people fell on their faces and said, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. I'm telling you that at this retreat, we want to bring that power down. 
We want to be able to have that power, possibility in praying that we'll be able to come to God like this, like Elijah, and we'll be able to bring the fire of God. But not only that, it said now, Ahab, run back home. There is abundance of rain. And he went to pray. First time, second time, third time, seven times consecutively without getting tired. Until the servant of Elijah said, I see a cloud like a man's hand rising up out of the sea. And he said, that's it. Tell him, if he doesn't run, that heavy rain that had not fallen for three and a half years will make him wet and delay his journey. And then, we're surprised, we're told Elijah, he was running with his chariot. Uh, sorry, Ahab was running with his chariot. Elijah ran without the chariot and overtook the chariot and went beyond him. I'm talking about power. Power from on high. Why are, why are we here if we're not going to pray like that? Why are we here if rain will not fall? Why are we here if the fire of heaven will not fall? Why are we here if the impossibilities of 3 years and 13 years and 30 years will not be removed? I'm telling you that we came together to pray and we are going to pray. Ezekiah prayed, and although the sentence of death had been passed upon him, and, Eli and um, Isaiah said, the Lord said, set your house in order because you will die. He said, Isaiah, go your way. I'll discuss it with Almighty God. And then he said, God, you sent Isaiah to me that I'm going to die. I'm not ready to die yet. Think about him. And like God said, your time is up. And the man said, I'm not ready to go. And God then said, Ezekiah, you are bold in prayer. All right, get 15 years more. Prayer. You can so pray and the destiny of your life will change. Jabez was born. And when he was born, there was evil proclaimed upon him. And his mother gave him the name Jabez because he was born with great difficulty and shame and sorrow. And then, by prayer, he changed his life for good. Jonah was even inside the belly of the whale. Everybody had forgotten him. The thought is gone. It's drowned. It's dead. And right in that place, in fact, in his own language, it was in the belly of hell. He said, I prayed and the Lord answered. Well, what are we going to say about the man, the thief on the cross, a criminal? He crucified him there. And he said, it's gone. He's going to go from that uh, cross and he's going to go to hell. He prayed, and he changed his destiny and received forgiveness and paradise. If all those people could pray, I believe you ought to pray. Point number three, time for prayer. And this retreat that we have come, it's time we have come apart so that we will be able to pray. And we are going to pray. I said we are going to pray. Time, it's time for penetration into heaven. It is time for power from on high. It is time for pleading our case before the Almighty God. It is time for possessing our possession. It is time for prevailing, persevering prayer. So that by the grace of God, when we have done all, we will wait patiently. And before we leave this retreat ground, we know that the answer will have to come. Jesus prayed early in the morning. And early every morning, from early hours of the morning, one prayers to be ascending on high. He prayed throughout the night sometimes. During this retreat, we want prayer to be going on to the throne of God, even in the night. I've told you about Elijah that prayed seven times con uh, consecutively, without interruption. How about Daniel? For 21 days, he was praying without giving up. May not always to pray and not to faint. Pray without ceasing. And during these few days we are together, it will be real time to pray until the blessing will come down. In Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. And in verse 12. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord, till he comes and rains righteousness 
upon you. Make up your mind that during this retreat, you will pray. And unlimited will be the possibilities of the answers to your prayer. I told you already that it is time to pray. For heaven's penetration, for power from on high, to bring a petition before the Lord, to plead our case before the Almighty, to possess our possession. We're going to prevail in prayer. I've shown you an example of the people that prayed. What record are we going to have of your own prayer? Let's rise up and pray. It's time to pray. Pierce heaven. Possess your possession. Plead your case. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Is it for salvation? Is it for peace of mind? Is it for assurance of sonship? Is it for victory over sin? Is it for the sanctification circumcision of your heart? Is it for power of the Holy Ghost? Is it for living the life of Christ on earth? Do you have any great, mighty, extraordinary thing you want the Lord to do for you? It's time to pray. You shouldn't go back the way you came. You shouldn't remain an ordinary Christian. It's time to pray. Christ in you the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let him do an extraordinary work of grace in your very heart. Extraordinary work of grace in your very heart. Why should you come back home? Why should you go back home the way you came? A change must take place. A change must take place. Abraham prayed, Jacob prayed, Moses prayed, Elijah prayed, Jonah prayed, even the thief on the cross prayed, and a lot of other people who prayed, they changed history and destiny. Make this retreat time a time of praying.
make this retreat time a time of praying and praying through. Praying and praying through. Let there be victory over sin. Victory over sin. Yes, you can have the victory. Why should anything like sin be binding you down? Why should you be so weak, yielding to temptation? You can have victory in the Lord. Victory in Christ. Over every form of sin, the power coming from the throne of God can blow sin into pieces in your life. Yours will be the victory. Yours will be the victory.